Hi everyone. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. Friends, I'm John Cavadini. I'm the director of the Institute for Church Life, and the Institute for Church Life hosts these lectures on football Saturdays called Saturdays with the Saints. And I actually wrote that down, but I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Saturdays with the Saints, an initiative of the Institute for Church Life intended as a moment of contemplative reflection, a time set aside before the busy activity of game day to reflect on the lives of the saints. <clears throat> Saturday, after all, is the ancient Sabbath. It is the day the Lord rested after completing the work of creation. So, in this moment of contemplative rest, we are in good company, namely with the Lord. In fact, the seventh day, the day of rest, is an image of the eternity that is promised to the pilgrim people of God, and that even now is the domain of the saints. Here's a passage from St. Augustine. Ready? That will truly be the greatest of Sabbaths, a Sabbath that has no evening, the Sabbath that the Lord approved at the beginning of creation, where it says... God rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he had been doing, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. We ourselves shall become that seventh day. Its end will not be an evening, but the Lord's day, an eighth day, as it were, which is to last forever, a day consecrated by the resurrection of Christ, foreshadowing the eternal rest, not only of the spirit, but of the body, too. There we shall be still and see. We shall see and we shall love. We shall love and we shall praise. Behold what will be in the end without end. For what is our end but to reach that kingdom <coughs> which has no end? end quote. In other words, friends, if the Sabbath day of rest is an image of the eternal life of the saints, it will literally be an unending Saturday with the saints. <laughs> and our humble lecture series here on football game days provides a foretaste of eternity. I bet you didn't anticipate that. <laughs> this little reflection shows us how fitting our topic is for today. In honor of the solemnity of all saints, we're departing from our normal practice of considering the life of an individual saint and reflecting on the doctrine of the community of saints professed every time we say the Apostles' Creed through the theology of Pope Benedict XVI. And I can think of no better person to lead us through this reflection than my colleague, Cyril O'Regan, whom it is my pleasure now to introduce. Cyril holds the Catherine Husking Chair of Theology here at the University of Notre Dame, where he teaches courses in philosophical and systematic theology. Cyril is an internationally acclaimed theologian whose work if one were to recount it title by title, would perhaps seem distant from the concerns of a football Saturday, <coughs> where we have simply taken a time out, the first of those officially allowed. <laughs> Cyril is famous for his work on the philosopher and would-be theologian G.W.F. Hegel for his studies of the theologian and almost cardinal, Hans Urs von Balthasar, for his work on the return of the ancient heresy of Gnosticism in modern theology, and for his surrogacy for Michael the Archangel in defending us in battle, as it were, against the prophets of suspicion, both past and present, who would negate the theological enterprise altogether as invalid for modern people. These concerns may seem impossibly distant from the simple devotion of the saints, which our series celebrates. And yet, if one reflects just one moment more, one realizes that Cyril's work, above all, entails the question, in what spirit should theology be done? What is the proper spirit of the theologian, the spirit which is not the spirit of this world, but yet is firmly in this world? The spirit which rejects the arrogance of the 19th century bombast of somebody like Hegel, and all of its heirs, that would turn theology wholly into an enterprise of reason, eschewing the particularity of revelation that in fact is seen so clearly in all of the saints. 
proper spirit for theology is the same spirit out of which arises devotion to the saints, in whom God's rest appears in so many irreducibly concrete and unique lives. And in that same spirit, I am sure you will all join me in welcoming Cyril O'Regan for today's installment of Saturdays with the Saints. thing for me to do uh, today. Let me first start by thanking John, whose eloquence matches his charity. The paper I'm giving this morning, or the talk I'm giving this morning, uh, is to some extent the first part of what I would originally have liked to do, which is really to talk about the communion of saints. Uh, rather than do that, uh, the introduction to that is Benedict on the saints, that is, Benedict XVI's understanding of what the saint is and what the saint is not. So let me start sort of now by introducing the topic, um, and then the paper will have two major moments. That is, the first moment is going to be Benedict defining what or who a saint is. And the second moment of the paper, and the shorter section of the paper, is Benedict talking about the problem of sainthood, the construction and the understanding of sainthood in the modern period. So I begin. While the enthusiasm for the canonization of saints may be somewhat less exuberant than it was in the case of John Paul II, the behavior of Benedict XVI suggests that there is no essential break between himself and his charismatic predecessor in terms of the basic conviction that the church is or is to be the church of saints and that saints signal the Catholicity of the church in being male and female, in being of different ethnicities, in being religious and lay, in comprising different histories, in having lived in, through, and been marked by different historical circumstances and faced very different, indeed sometimes unique, challenges. Benedict has demonstrated during his pontificate a particular predilection for considering the relationship between theology and sainthood, as illustrated in his writings on St. Paul, in his conferences on the Church Fathers, his elevation of the individual medieval mystic Hildegard of Bingen to the status of doctor of the church, his very personal interest in the ongoing process of the canonization of John Henry Newman, and the fervency of his espousal for the case of canonization of John Paul II. Still, as with John Paul II, the background of these canonized, the ones to be canonized, are extremely various. One of the more recent elevation concerns the 17th century Mohawk Indian Ketari Ketawitta, who lived a life of simple witness through her suffering. And of course, we can add another North American saint, Marianne Cope, the French Franciscan nun who cared for lepers uh, in Haiti in the 19th century. Now, a cynical view might have it that here as elsewhere, that what is important for Benedict is the Petrine office rather than some deep conviction of the value of sainthood. And that this expresses itself in a kind of business as usual mentality with respect to the processes of canonization. Now, of course, such a view would necessarily conveniently ignore Benedict's long-standing conviction of the fundamental rightness of the Catholic support of the saints against Reformation objections, as well as his sense of the enduring value of popular Catholic piety in which devotion to the saints have played an important role. And above all, it would ignore the fact that consistently throughout his writings prior to becoming Pope, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the future Benedict XVI not only defended saints against the secularist dismissive sneer and the tendency in modernity to pathologize the saints, they are obviously unhealthy, excessive, fanatic, and 
at least uncouth, but he also made the argument that perhaps more so than any time in history, the church is in need of saints. And there are essentially two reasons why this is so. First, to validate and to vindicate Christianity, which, if guided by a basic vision that gets expressed in ideas and doctrines, is in the final analysis a life. And secondly, to prove a leaven in a secular world riddled with relativism and inclined towards a fatuous moralism in which, and here I probably do go beyond Benedict, God gives us a sticker for our being good and for being ethically and politically responsible. It is important to explore a bit more the double edge of Benedict's sword here. In the Ratzinger report, written at the end of the 1970s, in reminding the church of the fruitfulness of the saints and the world of the need of witness, the future pope queries a burgeoning hierarchy in the church which, relatively speaking, exaggerates the importance of the theologian and relativizes that of the saint. I would have done perhaps okay with the first and could do pretty bad with the second. <laughs> Bendix seems to think that the exaggeration of the importance of the theologian lies in thinking of the theologian as a kind of virtuoso in Christian thought, who is rightly or should be admired for his or her genius or talent in religious matters. But to think this is to have caught a romantic bug. The theologian, whether religious or lay, is an ecclesial person for whom the simple faith of the church provides the bedrock. Theology is nothing more nor less than faith-seeking understanding, an elucidation of the faith given to the church in and by Christ and articulated in the symbols and practices and forms of life all this with the help of the Holy Spirit. The theologian cannot, or at least should not, be a kind of ecclesial rock star. And the second deformation is the functional priority given to reflection in Christianity over the consideration of Christianity as a life to be lived towards God through Jesus Christ. Now, at first, it would seem very odd indeed that the future pope, who is himself a major theologian, a supporter of doctrine, arguably even early on in his career, one of the foremost catechists in the church, and above all, a critic of activist forms of Catholicism that too easily, in his view, leave behind normative Christian thought, would be making this kind of complaint, too much reflection. But make the complaint he does. For in his view, genuine Christianity, which is the Christianity of the gospel, means discipleship, as this is undergirded by faith. What is indefeasible about Christianity, he believes, is conforming one's entire life to the incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. To become a Christian is to become crystal formed. This means that all Christians are called to be saints. If it is peculiarly a contemporary temptation to replace this vocation by the ambition of being a moral self, it has been a perennial temptation to presume that holiness is the prerogative of a special cadre of persons, whether monks, clergy, or religious, and did not apply to all Christians by dint of baptism. As a faithful interpreter of Vatican II in general, and Lumen Gentium in particular, both before and after he was pope, Benedict enthusiastically supports the universal call to holiness. I come now to my first section, that is Benedict's understanding of the saint. And the heading for this really is the saint as icon. To say that the saint is an icon, is to say something quite particular, and precisely not to say that the saint is more famous than the rest of us because of some extraordinary religious traits 
and near superhuman capacities. And Nikon is a figure that you see through to Christ, who is the definitive expression of God's love, God's unfathomable, unfathomable desire to be with us and to redeem us. We who have become strangers to him and to ourselves in and through misguided uses of freedom. The saint is not an idol, a charismatic figure, a larger than life celebrity who arrests our attention. The saint does not, shall we say, sub in for Christ, either permanently or to give Christ the blow. The saint is indeed a light in the world, but precisely one who does not interpose herself between the believer and Christ, thereby displacing Christ. And while over, overall Benedict believes that the Reformation went too far in its assumption that there is necessarily a zero-sum game between Christ and the saints, he is nonetheless grateful to the reformers for bringing to Christianity's attention the ever-present danger that the saint becomes the idol, the one who becomes our last thing rather than the true last thing, that is, the infinite triune God. Surely this has happened in the past and can happen in the future. Benedict's point, however, is that when it happens, it is purely a contingent affair. It happens, but there is no inbuilt necessity for it to happen. And it won't happen if Christian vision is not distorted. Christianity is not a religion of intermediaries in a great chain of being between God and the world, in which the saint functions as a semi-divine being, filling in the gaps between ourselves and the distant and inaccessible God. In a host of texts, but perhaps preeminently in his magisterial Jesus of Nazareth, Christ is the one and only mediator. For Benedict, saints are real and not ideal persons. Saints are persons with strengths and weaknesses marked by different charisms, and all saints live unrepeatable lives. They are heavenly not because they are angelically pure and outside history and the complex context in which all of us find ourselves making decisions, but because, as St. Paul says, they have run the race and permitted grace to raise them beyond their frailties and precisely to use these frailties for the glory of God. Frailties. Frailties discuss cover different aspects of ourselves as embodied beings who are creatures of God. Vulnerabilities such as fatigue and disappointment, fear of pain, fear of being in the wrong, fear of being alone. Frailties are also those capacities that we almost have too much of and which can just as easily get in the way of a deep relationship with God as it can foster it. And finally, frailties can be characterized um, by dispositions and patterns of behavior that actually separate us from God. With regard to the first, we can see how Oscar Romero deals with the all too human fear of death and being in the wrong as he makes his way towards martyrdom. With regard to the second, the frailty characterized by what we have too much of rather than too little, we can see how if it initially obstructs, finally it becomes an instrument of profound relationship with God. With Augustine, this frailty is passion. With Ignatius Iola, it is the mentality of the warrior. With Catherine of Siena, it is a fearsome will. With Thérèse of Lisieux, it is her sense of her own extraordinariness. It is in conversion or turning around that these would-be weaknesses or frailties are made strengths. In Augustine, in 
a restless and relentless passion for God, in Ignatius in a decision to serve the banner of Christ, in Catherine of Siena in coming to make one's furious will pliant and solely an expression of God's will, and in Therese in putting one's own extraordinariness on the back burner to the fundamental extraordinariness of God. Our passions are too much and are too little. Our habits of doing and not doing don't have to be and usually are not neutral with respect to God. Sometimes they get twisted and are pushed at a slant. And when pushed at a slant, then we are talking about sin and our capacity to sin. And especially about the tendency, fathoms deep, to draw attention to our deeds, our aspirations, our goodness, the tendency to loop back to ourselves in admiring self-regard. And thus, after so much promise, reduce Christ to the status of a disinvited guest. To avail of Facebook, one can see with saints that they are suspicious regarding the friending of Christ. Precisely in the act of friending, there may simultaneously be an act of defriending. And almost all the Christian saints were aware of just how treacherous our self-regard is. We have no sooner given it up, and it returns the back door to buffer and buff us up. And this is why John Henry Newman, who with Augustine is perhaps one of Benedict's theological models, thought that when saints speak of themselves as great sinners, they are not posturing and not vying with each other in some kind of spiritual Olympiad as to who is the most humble. They're being totally realistic. Pride is literally the X factor. It is variable rather than a constant. You can be proud of your looks, your position, your education, your athletic accomplishments. You can be proud equally of your total lack of these. You can, be, you can become proud of your goodness and sweetness of the sacrifices you have made. You can, Come proud of how honest you are with regard to your sins. Everywhere the emphasis falls on my or mine. At any moment, it can happen. The mirror becomes the world. And as you stand in front of it and ask, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You almost inevitably see your own smile smiling back. Now, to assume the office of Peter, and Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger felt this in the most acute, acute fashion, is, in some sense, a terrible thing. It is not only to assume an extraordinary burden, but involves essentially a contraction of oneself into the tradition of the church and a fundamental erasure of your particular take on things. It seems appropriate to think that in becoming Benedict XVI, the erstwhile Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger has experienced the pain of surrendering his privacy and the quiet joy of being a thinker who negotiates complex theological issues, agreeing with some theologians while disagreeing with others. I suppose in some, of one, in some obvious sense, it probably was slightly easier for Ratzinger than perhaps some others, since throughout his entire career as a theologian, he had tried to express the fate of the church rather than gain kudos for the brilliance of his views. Accordingly, his articulation of the idea of the saint is no exception. Sainthood has been exhibited throughout history. It is for us to see the spiritual depth of the saints and their unique witnessing to Christ. And it is not as if the church has not thought deeply about sainthood in terms of the requirement of grace and how saints as such do not mediate salvation. What is required is that we remember what has been said, whether by Augustine or Newman or by Bonaventure or Thomas Aquinas. When we look at the high view of human being in Benedict's encyclicals, we realize that as Benedict is arguing for the universal call to holiness, he is also recalling the importance of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity as defining Christian life and thus the life of the saint. The saint, in the first instance, is the one who has faith. 
whose two basic constituents are vision and commitment. Determinate beliefs and doctrines arise out of and explicate a vision. And ecclesial practices and faithful forms of life, they in turn elucidate a commitment. Faith is primitive, faith is primordial. It cannot be replaced by reason, no matter what the amp. Second, the life of the saint is a hope-filled life. As Cardinal Ratzinger, the proper understanding of hope has been a concern sort of throughout all his work. And as Benedict, and Benedict himself, or the previous Cardinal Ratzinger, puts the seal of approval, seal of the importance of hope in space alvi. So whether as theologian, cardinal, or pope, Benedict relies on tradition to avoid two confusions. First, that hope and optimism are synonymous, or nearly so. Second, that hope rests in the conviction that a just world will be actual in the future and that we have the means to bring it about. Now, Benedict cannot think of Christianity being a sunny religion. He does think, however, of it as joyful. But joy occurs against the backdrop of accepting pain, frustration, and failure in life. And he inveighs in his encyclicals and also his non-papal Jesus of Nazareth against confusing the kingdom of God with the kingdom of the world and for having confidence that a certain set of tactics or strategies magically enables one to secure an unrepealable justice and peace. Justice and peace are everywhere to be sought. But first, it is more than human justice and peace that is truly desired. And secondly, it is God and not human beings who exercise the rule over history. The hope of the sanctified Christian or saint is then often more nearly hope against hope and the posture of the saint in the final instance when it comes to outcomes is thy will be done. The final and ultimate characteristic of the saint is love. One cannot be a disciple of Christ and not love for Christ is the full expression of the triune God who is defined by love. This is the central vision of Christianity and is articulated in its most comprehensive form in Bendis encyclical, Leos Caritas Est. The saint is a place where love happens and is displayed in a witnessing to God that goes beyond the individual's strength and in forgiving one's enemies, which is something that is more nearly impossible than simply difficult for us. I could say more here, but one point that should almost certainly be made is that Benedict is anxious to think of the average Christian and the saint to be on a continuum rather than the saint and the Christian to be fundamentally distinct kinds of religious believer, of Christian believer. The question arises, is there anything uniquely specifying or individuating about Benedict's view of the saint? I put another way, are there any quite specific uh, influences that come out in Benedict's interest in the saint and how he sees them? I think the answer is yes. And here, as with Benedict's reflection on Christ, God, and the church, the influence of Henri de Lubac and hans von Balthasar is paramount. Early in his theological career, Benedict worries with the Lubac about the tendency in the Catholic Church to distinguish between ordinary or exoteric and extraordinary and esoteric forms of Christianity. Now, while this usually takes the form of contrasting the boring institutional church and the charismatic elite, it can also function to open up a gap in reality rather than function between saints and ordinary members of the church. Benedict does not wish to criticize any of the roles that saints have played throughout history, but it is important not to think of saints as fundamentally different from the ordinary Christian. For this is to make the Gnostic mistake of talking about a distinction in kind rather than a distinction in function. 
And Bendix seems to have both generally and quite particularly been influenced by the reflection of Hans Urs von Balthasar on the nature of saints. Balthasar, as with the Lubach, insisted on the continuum between saints and ordinary Christians by thinking of each as being supported by and elevated by great grace and each as being called by God. The difference between the saint and the ordinary Christian lies in the quality of response. In the case of the saint, the response to the call moves towards but does not realize the total self-giving manifest in the incarnation, passion, and death of Christ. Unlike what we find in the Gospels, in contrast to Christ, in every saint, there is something, a little something, that resists full conformity to the will of God, which is a will to unconditionally trust, hope, and love. But Benedict also seems to share Balthasar's sense that as touched by God's glory, saints are tokens of beauty in a world that is destitute of it. To use a somewhat degraded image, the saints are points of divine light in the world, the points at which the glory of God shines and attracts. Balthasar is not saying that saints are nice or that they are kinds of ornaments of goodness. This is at once kitsch and a colossal theological misunderstanding. The lives of many of the saints are hardly beautiful in any common garden sense. Their lives are hard, traumatic, diseased, and debt-filled. In short, in a worldly sense, their lives are ugly, sometimes incomparably ugly. Moreover, it is only if one forgets that the saint is a disciple of Christ that one would ever have been inclined to such a view in any event. For the cross itself is terrible. Thus, if the life of Christ unto the cross is beautiful in some fundamental way, I take it it is a kind of terrible beauty. I think after Balthasar Benedict wishes to say this and to say no less than the saint forces us to reconsider what we take to be beautiful and what we understand to be the beautiful life. Even more than Balthasar, Benedict understands our inherent paganism on this score. The saint speaking to the modern world. Benedict wants contemporary Catholicism not only to be unembarrassed by the saints and martyrs, but to understand that the saints and their extraordinary variety show us the almost infinite variety of ways to be disciples of Christ and participators in the mystery of God. But his message is not simply directed to the church, but in line with the double-sided reflection of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, but also Gaudium et Spes, it is directed towards the world. Of course, Benedict thinks that lies of the saints function as much as an argument for and a validation of Christianity as the unfolding of doctrinal truths, perhaps even more. He cannot see why that would change even in the profoundly confused modern period in which there was never so much invested in reason and never so much lack of confidence in it. Of course, the signs for the saints are not auspicious, and it's very unlikely Benedict thinks that the saints will get a hearing. Contemporary secular culture is both relativistic, a common theme of Benedict, and iconoclastic. It is relativistic in two different ways, although these ways usually go together. On the one hand, the secular world wants to refer to the bevy of forms of sainthood and excellence throughout history and suggests that different cultures and societies have different constructions. Yes, there are saints, but there are different constructions throughout history. And of course, Christians should beware of thinking they have a monopoly. There are Jewish and Muslim saints, and there are holy men and women in all major world religions. That's on the one side. On the other, the secularist also wants to suggest 
that sainthood represents an idiom of excess and fanaticism that is dangerously uncontrollable and thus should be discouraged, if not absolutely shunned. Bender keeps in mind both Pascal and Newman on this point. Pascal, when he says that the new world order emerging in the 17th century is that sort of of the average sensual man. And Newman in the 19th century when he suggested that under the umbrella of enlightened Christianity, the saint has been replaced by the citizen, the good enough person whose virtues fundamentally amount to socially approved vices such as making money and lots of it. It is not surprising, therefore, that these relativist, relativistic views are supported by the pathological construction of the actual or would-be saint. That is, the constitutive lack of moderation in the saint speaks to a fundamentally unhealthy lack of balance. Now, these two sides of the relativistic modern age militate, of course, against the acceptance of the very idea of the saint. But then, there's a second element. There is the natural iconoclastic tendency of modern culture, its tendency to level even as it arbitrarily elevates. For example, Mother Teresa's apparently heroic sacrifice in the streets of Calcutta over a period of 60 years becomes for a secularist like Hitchens a kind of sign of adamantine stubbornness and feral stupidity in her not realizing that the alleviation of poverty and disease is rightly programmatic rather than a particular res response to a particular leper dying in the streets and for whom you can only give palliative care. In significant respects, iconoclasm here with respect to the saint is similar to iconoclasm exercised with respect to our athletic and military heroes as well as those who either hold important office or happen to be celebrities. The saint and these others provide an opportunity for spectacle, but also schadenfreude. We're going to have joy sort of in the fall from grace. Uh, that's one, one part. The other part sort of is moral lesson, which puts us, of course, uh, in the control position of being at once cynic, which we can approve of, and being ardent moralists, which we also approve of. Perhaps, however, in the contemporary world, the takedown of the would-be saint is often even more virulent and unyielding. There's a slight margin of forgivability for heroes, officials, and celebrities on this account, for after all, they don't officially deny that they have clay feet. Thus, the bulimic and self-involved Lady Diana can find some measure of exculpation in the tabloids the very same week that Mother Teresa is condemned. On the secularist front, Frailty is supposedly what saints and their supporters deny. Now this despite the fact that the secularists are at the same time accusing the saints of another bigotry, that is the claim that we are all sinners. One can think of Benedict's encyclical Charity in Truth as a kind of commentary on the secularist attack against the idea of the Christian saint. When Benedict speaks to the excess of charity over justice. He points to what is unprogrammatic about Christianity. That the church <clears throat> is charged not only with the alleviation of material suffering. It is thus charged, however. But with being the custodian of the yes that God says to each person at the time of creation and renews in the redemption wrought by Jesus Christ. Benedict is mindful of Dostoevsky's diagnosis of the constitutive dilemma of the modern do-gooder, whether utopian or non-utopian. That is, that they are often much more comfortable dealing with human beings in general than dealing with this particular broken and flawed human being, in particular, who might invalidate one's prejudices about the noble poor. Benedict understands that there is a trap and wants the secular world to admit that it has set it. In the meantime, the Christian is called to holiness, to let her life be a light in the church and in the world, 
This is the way it has always been. And though so that we understand that our circumstances are dire, we have no way of gauging whether or not the obstacles set by the modern age are intrinsically more serious than other times. We can think of the early church, and of origin in particular who had to justify martyrdom in a world that did not have the conceptual means to see the point. So having discerned specific difficulties of the modern period, one has simply to go on, to shape a life according to the truth, and to do so without absolute guarantees, and certainly without the guarantee of the applause of a world which constructs the saint as constitutionally odd and unhealthy. Doubtless, this demands courage. But for Benedict, the emphasis does not fall here. To believe that the saint is the model for every Christian is to be convinced that the Christian life is true and that this truth shows itself. But it shows itself where it does. And one can no more completely repress it than make sure that it has been seen. All of this is God's business. Our task is to live the Christian life. That there will be pain is perfectly evident. But in the end, Benedict wants to say that the life of the saint is luminous and beautiful, even in suffering and death. Moreover, a life which is defined by a particular vocation and represents an obedient answer to the call of God to be whom you are meant to be, and that this bespeaks a life of genuine freedom. Because on Benedict's view, what else is freedom but your uncoerced response of yes to God's yes to you that was given so absolutely and so gratuitously. Thank you. Friends, we do have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would have been the paper that I would have given and so forth. So um, <laughs> maybe the best way of putting it, sort of, which is in line of the paper, rather than to get sort of into uh, what is the relationship between the living and the dead. Which, if we have a fourth sort of, uh, you know, year, sort of, I think I'll sort of just do the paper that I intended to do. So let me give a short answer rather than the full answer. Uh, Benedict, and I take this, sense, this is the sense of your question as well, that one sort of other things about saints, and perhaps one of the ways in which sort of Christians and Catholics in particular sort of you know, can be deformed in their spirituality, is to think sort of that um, when we sort of are talking about Christian life, uh, it is me before God and it's I before God. Now, Benedict, I think, wants to say sort of a, a somewhat sort of complex thing or hold a complex proposition. Benedict, on the one hand, wants to say that this sort of me sense sort of, you know, of that um, I, will inherit, I will inherit eternal life or sort of I sort of uh, am coming in my own life, my real life now before sort of I die, I'm coming more nearly in contact with God than the rest of you. Clearly, from his point of view, that has to be a deformation because if sainthood is real on the basis of what I've just said, Sainthood is letting go sort of, you know, of your own prerogatives and your own advantages. So on the, on the one hand, you've got to make sure that's not sort of the Christian position, and you've got to announce it not to be the Christian position. On the other hand, which might sort of be involved in a reaction, a, a proper reaction to this, but gives you a very different and opposite result, that will turn out to be another kind of deformation. You might think sort of because... Um, there has been an overemphasis upon private spirituality and private gain with respect to eternal life. Then sort of that um, Christianity is social all the way through. Uh, persons, individual persons, don't matter at all. 
it's quite clear, Ben, that they think that's wrong as well. So the question sort of is, how do you hold together that Christianity is a communal religion? That is, we are always in communion. Persons are, in, persons, are persons as well as they are sort of involved in the community. That's a fundamental to the Christian and Catholic tenet. And at the same time, you don't have a community if you erase those particular persons. So there is a certain sense in which, at a rock bottom level, individual persons are also reducible. So we are, at, this, at one and the same time, irreducibly and individually before God. But we are irreducibly and individually before God precisely as persons sort of in communion, with, communion with others. Now one, I think, litmus test then, if, if we're talking sort of about saints, and suppose for the moment we're thinking not merely of saints having sort of, shall we say, a different kind of response to God than most of us, and a different, shall we say, level of participation with God than most of us. I take that as the kind of functional distinction between you, you and me, and the saint. There has been sort of throughout history sort of ways in which then sort of this kind of personal or individualistic element has come through sort of sometimes in fairly noxious forms. That is, the minimal form of it is, uh, I am saved, I'm special and I'm saved and you are not. The maximum form is it, I'm special, saved and you are not, and I'm very happy to kind of see sort of know that you've got your comeuppance. <laughs> Hansel von Balthasar, and I think Benedict is not going to contradict him on this, said sort of that when it comes to the notion, when it comes to the understanding of salvation that a saint would have, the understanding of salvation that a saint would have is that, and it would be deformed if a saint did not have it, is the hope that everyone else, every, everyone, the hope is everyone will be saved. And the hope is everyone will, be, everyone will be saved. Not the knowledge that everyone will be saved. The hope is that everyone will be saved because we're in this together. We are bonded together. So even at the moment at which uh, we are talking about salvation, and salvation will not be a salvation of a collective, but a salvation of a person, implied in that is the hope sort of, you know, for the entire community. Should that not be the case, should that not regulate one's imagination and one's vision, it's quite clear so that there's a, a, you know, a spiritual blight. So the communion is built into the very, the very fabric, even of your most personal relationship to God. That, I think, would get sort of to at least part of the issue that you're raising. Ed? You mentioned that uh, Pope Benedict wants the secular world to <coughs> admit that there are many traps that are being put out Well, I think in some extent I've addressed it already, Ed, at least sort of, you know, uh, you know, grossly, and uh, you know, I, I think I'll continue to speak grossly rather than too finely. Um, I think this is not. Let me just sort of step back from that. I'll elucidate that momentarily. But let me step back sort of and make sort of a prior comment. One of the things sort of about our situation, our modern situation is that it seems as if religious believers of all stripe put themselves sort of in an almost untenable position. That is, they either accept or feel they have to accept the various kind of stereotyping sort of that occur within secular society. Uh, but, if, but if they don't accept those, that they tend to think of themselves sort of you know, as forced into sort of a kind of ghetto mentality. Uh, and therefore, sort of, uh, even though they will deny it, feel that they're involved sort of, you know, in a kind of reactionary position. <clears throat> That's the generic setup. Because what it assumes is that the only time you would ever attack secular presuppositions is if sort of, you, know, you had a kind of front bore sort of reactionary sort of form sort of, you know, of Christianity, or front bore reactionary form sort of, of Islam. But, but even if you were not a theologian, even if you were not sort of, you know, a believing Christian, there's no reason to suppose that the modern world is not a setup. Why would you suppose that? I mean, the fact sort of that um, 
modernity sort of comes in sort of and suggests that uh, everything sort of, there's nothing fundamentally true, or if there is something fundamentally true, we can't get at it. it. Therefore, there's only a bevy sort of, you know, of relative truths uh, which compete with each other, and they're winners and losers, but really sort of, you know, we have no decision procedure to decide among them. Who says that's true? It's not clear, so that that's not obvious in the slightest that it's true, but it functions as if it's true. So if you were a philosopher, and I started out being a philosopher, it seems to me so that that's probably an untenable position. But of course, I don't get to decide what the world should look like. It's a pity. I think I do a better job than the way it's turned <laughs> out. Because society, in terms of its ideas, um, is a kind of primal soup in which we all bathe. Uh, we're all affected by it. And it takes energy so, you know, to kind of get outside the soup sort of, and say, well, what is that on my body that I didn't put there? And that doesn't seem to have, despite itself, a fantastic amount of justification for being there. We find ourselves where we find ourselves. And the secularist is wonderful at using the word ideology when it comes to religion. Right? So obviously, religion is ideological because Various people have various ideas, and from those various ideas, some people get carried away and do very bad things indeed, sort of, and we kind of disapprove of it. But, maybe I'm Irish and suspicious, what goes around comes around. Um, who's to say that ideas like um, everything is equally true, everything is equally false, that has never been justified. Christians, believers sort of within any faith, suggest that there's something which has not been justified. Right, that's called revelation, something which is given to us. Christians announce the fact that you're not going to be able to reason all the way down. Secular society acts as if you could reason all the way down, but essentially what you've got sort of is kind of microwaved ideas that has no ownership whatsoever, except sort of it seems to be there and seems sort of that to have a certain kind of allure or would demand energy from you to question it. One of the geniuses of Benedict before he was pope is precisely that, well, okay, um, we have all these, all these ideas which are unquestioned. That's the definition of ideology. You call it out. An ideology are a set of ideas which operate as if they were true, and only stupid people will question it. That's the setup. So the question then would be, do you want to be a stupid person? And Benedict puts his hand up and says, I want to be one of those stupid persons. Because it's not self-evident. It can and does function ideologically. No one is arguing the point. Maybe a philosopher might argue the point, but they can be argued back against. But society is not a set of arguments. It's a set of, I would call it, sort of hand-me-down clothes that sort of people kind of step into. Um, they just find them there, they put them on and so forth, and they scratch or they don't scratch, and so they fit or they, or they scratch. Um, that's what happens. So Benedict, at least sort of as a theologian, and now sort of theologian sort of is positive rather than negative, I think he, one of the tasks he thinks a theologian has is uh, to do precisely sort of what uh, the rationalist is saying you should do, be critical, including be critical of the rationalist and the secularist. The rationalist wants to control the debate and say these items are criticizable, the ones that he or she has decided, but other items, including misuses of reason, they're not criticizable. That's setting the game up and bending the cause the game. That's only part of the answer, Ed, sort of, but uh, I'll be seeing you outside this so I can sort of you know, speak to further things. We have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I was uh, thinking when you were talking about um, pensions of um, Susan Wolfe's paper, Moral Saints, in which she makes the argument from a secular and deterministic uh, point of view that we should liken saints to the, um, the way we view morally reprehensible people, um, psychopaths, that have some sort of um, neurological abnormality. And she makes the same argument for, for moral saints that um, 
that we should be looking for some sort of uh, neurological abnormality, and that because of that, they are not going to be um, things, you know, people that we should emulate. And I was wondering, uh, while obviously in, within the Christian worldview, we're not going to accept such a, a deterministic mindset, is there any worry uh, in your mind, possibly in, um, in uh, Benedict's mind, that there is something about the saint that removes, that, that um, does not allow us to be in full communion? Because we do take seriously the idea that um, the morally reprehensible, um, more often than not, do they do have some sort of neurological problem that separates them out, that, that removes the conversation uh, or the, the, makes a distance there. Right. Okay, so two parts of the answer. The first, the first part sort of has got to do sort of, you know, with the, the use of kind of a neurological kind of scientific sort of way of talking about science. And the second has got to do with is there something so fundamentally odd sort of about saying such that sort of there, there is a disparity between ourselves and them and so forth. Now notice actually the objection. Now you're just relaying the objection. I'm not saying that you are supporting the objection. This I think should make us suspicious of the uses of science as opposed to science. There is no study of saints where it has been neurologically proved that sort of the saints are abnormal neurologically. And yet so we have philosophers stating that um, this should be, this would be the case, perhaps saying it should be the case and will be the case. That's a fundamental breakdown of the notion of science. So all of a sudden, we have to distinguish between the difference between what science does and how people availing of science ideolo ideologically talk. So that sort of is a thoroughgoing ideological use of science because a science, that's not a scientific way. It either is or is not the case. You have either tested it or not. You've verified it or you've falsified it. And you've done none of those things. None of those things. So that's clearly sort of a kind of rationalistic kind of throwing sort of, you know, the tomato sort of, you know, at, at saints. That's all that it amounts to. The second question then, sort of, is there something so fundamentally odd sort of, you know, with saints such that sort of, you know, they uh, exceed us to such an extent sort of that we still are left behind. And therefore, shall we say, the uh, difference in quantity of virtue assumes a kind of equality. Now, first of all, sort of, uh, were some saints really odd by any normal standard? The answer to that is probably yes. Some, but only some. So Francis, I take it, I mean, Francis rushed in the door, sort of, and Francis wasn't wearing clothes. I think, sort of, you know, we'd all become petty bourgeois at that particular point, right? <laughs> um, someone is dealing, Father Damon is dealing with lepers, or, or some of the actions of Therese of Lisieux, for instance, right? Uh, they, sort of, you know, would tend sort of, towards the extreme. Now, remember, though, the definition of the saint would not validate those behaviors per se. So, for instance, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who's a major source of Benedict on the Saints, has a little bit, a little bit of trouble with Therese of Lisieux because he thinks that while Therese of Lisieux is a saint, there really is an element of theater in Therese of Lisieux. In other words, she's a saint despite that, not because of it. Right? So, we're not to think that they, in Christianity, Catholicism in particular, that all of a sudden, sort of, you know, somehow or other, we're psychologically obtuse. The church has been totally psychologically obtuse. That is, there are some behaviors which are excessive just simply by being abnormal. Other behaviors are excessive not because they're abnormal. It's just that a saint sort of, you know, has more stamina than the rest of us, more belief and faith and hope than the rest of us, and more love than the rest of us. In every other respect, they're like us. I would think Benedict is primarily talking about that. Remember what I said, that the difference between Christ and everyone else is there is likely to be sort of a residual of, I won't say uniqueness, but just simply idiosyncrasy, tick, if you like. To be a saint is not to have a particular tick. To be a saint sort of is to have a maximum of faith, hope, and charity that, for the most part, in good cases, your nervous, your tics, which can in fact sort of, you know, get in the way, somehow or other, miraculously by the grace of God, don't get in the way. But sometimes, 
In fact, always in some particular respect, they do. And that's why saints are not Christ. Thank you.